Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's CCPL seminar. We are continuing our, our special series uh, where we feature the work of our research postgraduate students. This is a series which my colleague, Professor Anselmo Reyes, uh, began. And he normally is here to chair these events. Unfortunately, uh, he's not in Hong Kong today, so he, yeah, he, uh, he's not uh, able to chair. He's asked me to chair, and it just so happens that the speaker is my PhD student, uh, Mr. Artem Sergev who has studied in Russia and also in the Netherlands. Um, and he's going to uh, do a, uh, a presentation about his PhD topic. And you'll see immediately that um, Artem is, is fascinated by, by two different things. One about democracy, or as he'll explain, the will of the people. Uh, and two, of course, is public international law. Uh, and his study is, is is a study to try to find an intersection or a convergence of these two important ideas. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Yan. And uh, yeah, well, my name is Artem. I'm originally from Russia. And today we will talk about the will of the people and formation of international law. Uh, we'll go, we'll start from the basics, since I know some of you don't have a background in public international law. So we'll start with a discussion, what is international law and what is the role of the state in formation of international law. Uh, then we'll move to the will of the people and the concepts like the consent of the governed as a basis of law and a basis of government. Uh, we'll explore whether there is connection between international law and the will of the people, and if there is a lack of connection, we will take a look into alternatives. Um, well, let's start with a basic definition, what is international law? And international law, it's a body of rules established by custom or a treaty recognized as legally binding by, uh, uh, between the nations and their relations with each other. So starting from the definition, there are several key points that we need to outline. First of all, um, the law is made by states as legal entities. So international law is mainly a law of states. And state is, of course, it's, uh, China, Russia, United States, any country in the world. Um, it's embodied in several very specific type of laws, other customs. So general practice accepted by law, which means that when you repeat something many times, and you recognize this as legally binding, it, become, it becomes uh, customary international law. And the second one are treaties. So those are agreements made uh, in international law. In a way, it's like, uh, if you compare it to domestic law, it's like contracts made between different individuals uh, in commercial law, for example. But in international law, those contracts exist between states. Um, and they're legally binding on one another. So one of the fundamental aspects of international law and the foundations of international law is that originally international law was applied only in relationship with states uh, and another state. Uh, now it's changed and we'll talk uh, about this a little bit in a minute. Um, so international law is a product of states and states are sovereign entities. Sovereignty means that they're the ultimate subject of law, therefore no one can bind them to do anything without their consent. Um, and one of the other foundations of international law is a lot of principle. Uh, it's a famous case, I think, from 1922 by Permanent Court of International Justice, which ruled that restrictions upon the independence of states can, cannot be presumed. Uh, therefore, state can do whatever it desires unless uh, he consented. Otherwise, he consented to do something else. He accepted a legally binding application. And one of the interesting discussions uh, in contemporary international law is whether can, states can do whatever they want in absence of a direct prohibition. So it, was, it goes to the Kosovo case and the secession of Kosovo. And Judge Sim uh, raised a pretty valid point that uh, like very much debated in the 21st century. What are the limits of state sovereignty? What states can do and can't do? Um, and generally, again, to the question, who makes the law? And the answer, again, uh, in, from the classical perspective, is states. And you can see the Hobbes Leviathan, which kind of 
summarize this perception of uh, social contract and uh, well, it's generally the importance of states. Um, and again, if we look at sources of international law, namely, for example, customs, customs are made exclusively by states. So if a state does something from classical perception, uh, all leaders can recognize this custom. Actions of individuals, actions of other entities, um, it's not contested, but generally they're not considered as contributing to customary international law. Um, uh, same goes to the treaties. So treaties can be drafted within, between states, or now they're mainly drafted within the context of international organizations. So what I mean by that, it's mainly the United Nations law and con uh, treaties like Vienna Convention, the law of the treaties, um, UNCLOS Convention on the law of the seas. So those type of treaties, they're drafted within the United Nations, uh, but at the end of the day, again, states decide whether or not to be bound by them. Um, and also it's important to note that international law is mainly the law of executive branch and states officers, so they don't have international legislature. There is no such thing as international parliament that creates international law. We have the United Nations General Assembly, but it doesn't really form the law. Uh, the resolutions by the General Assembly are generally, don't, they don't consider it as legally binding with few exceptions, but we will not go into that. Um, so again, uh, you can see that international law is very, very state-centric. Uh, states are the fundamental entities within international law. Um, however, there are other subjects of international law that emerge, and now there's a lot of discussions in international legal discourse goes around those subjects. Um, and those subjects, the main one, are international organizations. So we have the United Nations, we have NATO, we have World Trade Organization. And they consider the subjects of international law. So what does this mean? It means that they can hold rights and obligations under international law. Uh, they can even become part of the treaties. Uh, there are not pretty many examples of that, but now the European Union tried to uh, ascend to the European Convention of Human Rights, for example. Uh, so international organizations play a very big role in international law now. Um, they have a special limited legal personality. And this is very important to recognize. So as we said before, states are the ultimate entities. So they have the full sovereignty. They can do whatever. While in terms of international organizations, the personality is limited. So they can act only in capacity as into the relation of what they're created for. So for example, if we have World Trade Organization, its legal personality and its actions should be focused on uh, trade. Uh, and hence, World Trade Organization can make documents regarding, for example, uh, use of force or international humanitarian law because it's out of its competence. Um, and again, in comparison, states have ultimate competence. They can do whatever. Um, there are other subjects of law, for example, Holy See, uh, Malta, ICRC, uh, international organizations, different agencies. So within the UN, there are a lot of different agencies. And they, sometimes they, uh, they recognize us to have a special legal personality as well. There are also known self-governing peoples, liberation movements, armed groups, for example, uh, armed groups under in non-international armed conflicts, for example, ISIS. Technically, they can also kind of have, in a way, legal personalities they recognize by international law, and they can have duties and obligations under Geneva Conventions. Um, and data to interested territories. Now, we also have very, in the very contemporary discourse, indigenous people, individuals, and multinational enterprises. So major companies, uh, peoples, and even individuals now are considered whether or not they're subject of international law, to what extent, how they can contribute to international law, etc. Um, and again, their status, it's not really, it doesn't really recognize that well. There are a lot of debates, but now still international law tends to be very state-centric. It is important to mention, though, that international law is not static. So as we have, as we have seen, new subjects can emerge. They can change in their status and their capacity as legal entities. So international law is also evolving. Um, and they also play a role in contemporary lawmaking. So for example, different NGOs now when a government go to the United Nations to form a treaty or negotiate something related to international law, they usually bring a lot of like 
like 40 different NGOs with them as consultants. Like you have Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and actually during the drafting of different uh, human rights treaties, a lot of various NGOs contributed to the drafting of the text and to the creation of international human rights law. Uh, you can look, if you're more interested in this, you can look at the book called uh, Global Civil Society by Woodward. And she provided analysis of like a million different examples of how those NGOs actually helped to create international law. Um, we also have drafts produced by International Law Commission, for example, draft articles on state responsibility, and there to extend recognizes customary international law. We have customary IHL by International Committee of Red Cross, which is also to an extent recognizes legally binding. Um, we have a lot of soft law, so soft law is not really a law, but it's kind of a recommendation, which is sometimes can be considered as semi legally binding, so it's a very vague area in these terms. Um, and to an extent, even judicial decisions and the teaching of highly qualified academics, they can shape the interpretation of international law. And they also contribute to the formation of international law in its own way. Um, nevertheless, as we discussed all this, uh, now there is a lot of discussions over what those non-state entities can do in the sphere of international law, how they can contribute to the formation of international law. Uh, however, states are still the main subjects of international law. And no one can presume, still, like, no one can really presume limitations of, on their independence. Um, and this made me actually wonder, we focus so much on non-state actors, while states themselves still as the main subjects of international law, they're not fully explored in terms of uh, what is the source of their power. So states generally are artificial entities, so they're not a natural person. Those are uh, legal entities of a very special sort, of course. It's a very complicated political communities, but nevertheless, there's, uh, there's no such thing as a state in a very natural way. And <coughs> accordingly, as with other artificial entities, the power derives from external sources. Uh, so, for example, in domestic law, when we create, uh, like, LLC, we need a couple of people to form it, and so on and so forth. So, eventually, it's a duty of, of like, individuals to create it. And um, then I moved to the question, then, what is the source of states' authority to form international law? So, what gives states power to create international law legally binding on peoples? Um, and before we proceed to this question, there are several remarks on why this is actually important, why we should look into states to find the source of authority within the states and not elsewhere and not in like non-state actors. First of all, the source of the authority behind an entity that creates law defines the authority of the enacted law. Uh, and to clarify it, if an entity creates the law, the law will be binding to an extent that an entity itself has authority. So you see there is, uh, it's kind of like an interlinked connection. To give you an example, for example, <coughs> have just some random guy will, in the street will tell everybody to wear jeans 24 seven. He doesn't have authority and therefore no one will wear jeans. Like it's not, he does have authority to bind people to do that. But if a state legislator supported by the will of the people, democratically elected with officers to enforce the law, let's say everybody should wear jeans, then, well, if we're like in a very authoritarian state, everybody will wear jeans. So I hope you see my point. Do you? Okay. Anyway, uh, the legitimacy of the authority behind an entity that enacts law defines the legitimacy of the enacted law to the same extent. If we have a legislator that is illegitimate, it doesn't have you know, the legitimate power, supported by people or whatever, the laws that are enacted by this legislator, they don't have they don't have the legitimacy because legislator itself doesn't have the legitimacy. Um, and at the end of the day, the legitimacy is connected to the compliance with the law. Uh, so what do I mean by that? There's a lot of studies on the more we justify the law, the more law is understood as legitimate and necessary and enacted in the right way, the more people tend to comply with the law. And compliance with law, of course, is essentially important because this is why we make the law, for people to follow it. And uh, lastly, legitimate law is a sustainable long run solution. So sustainability of law depends on the legitimacy of law and the reasons behind the law. Um, and just a brief remark, so when I talk about authority, I generally refer to the legitimate authority, if I don't state otherwise. Um, 
So to find an authority of state to form international law, the first thing we can do is to actually to look inside the state and look at the things that constitute a state. So what makes state a state? And then we have four elements. Uh, a state was defined by Montevideo Convention as an entity that consists of four elements. We have a defined territory. Uh, we have a capacity to enter into relations with the other states, which is generally can be perceived as recognition by other states. We have a permanent population and a government. So the first two are not necessarily important as uh, defined territory. It's not even uh, it's. It's a part of the state, but it's not a conscious part of the state. The recognition is something that comes you know, after the formation of state in a way. And then we have a permanent population and a government. And as we will explore now, the government per se uh, in contemporary theory should be formed based on the will of the people. So first we have a permanent population as a fundamental element, and then we have a government as something that reflects the will of the people, to make it easier to communicate, cooperate, and live in a harmonious society. And um, there are several theoretical and practical and legal arguments to support the will of the people as the source of uh, authority of the state. Uh, we have the classical theory, which is a lot of, uh, which is actually a lot of political theory originally. We have uh, John Milton, who said that the power of the kings and magistrates is nothing else but only uh, what is derivative, transferred, and committed to them in trust from the people. We have, of course, theories of John Locke and Adam Smith that, uh, that the governments are legitimate to an extent uh, to what they reflect the will of the people. So those are the classical theories that actually define a lot of the democracy as we know it in a contemporary perception. Um, and also Edmund Burke said in all forms of government, the people are the true legislator. So consent is absolutely essential to its validity. Um, now we have more contemporary theory. And F classical theory referred more to political science. If we look at the contemporary legal theory, there are a lot of legal theorists who actually look at the authority of the law in terms of the will of the people, in terms of the consent of the government. Governed. So now they're trying to move this political theory in terms of the international legal theory. And um, it started with a recent article by Goldman who said that we should stop putting the concept of law into the center and ask ourselves what is the authority behind the law. Because law itself, it's not necessarily justified the law. Uh, then we have Waldron who argued pretty bravely that the true subject of international law are really human individuals because we are the main beneficiaries of the law. So law is created for us. For example, human rights law, why do we have it? We don't have it just you know, for sake of having it. We have it for it to make our lives better, uh, to benefit us in a certain way, to protect uh, you know, our way of living, our right to express ourselves, etc. Um, so in a sense, like. The laws are not created for states. Laws are created for people. Then we have Habermas, who said, uh, action norms are valid uh, to which all possibly affected persons could, could agree as participants in rational discourse. So in order for a norm to be binding, uh, people as a collective entity need to consent to it through a rational dialogue. Of course, on, if we look at this on an international level, it's impossible for individuals, as there are billions of us, to go there and consent to every particular single thing. And this is why we have government. But the point is that the government itself then should rest on the consent of the people in order for it to create legitimate law. Uh, we also have Frank, uh, uh, who said that the validation of the empowerment, um, that the uh, validation of the empowerment to govern rests on the consent of the governed, which is uh, a reflection of the classical perception of political theory, which Frank was purely a uh, legal scholar. So he tried again to move international law uh, to recognize democracy. Only in, in his article, The Emerging Right to Democratic Governments, he argued that international law binds states to be democratic and not uh, vice versa. And lastly, Wheatley, who kind of who's more cautious with it, who said that states remain the right to self-determine themselves democratically. So it is still within it is still up for states to define their form of governance. So if it's a territorial form of governance, if they democratically selected a territorial form of governance. 
then such governments would be legitimate. But nevertheless, uh, the fundamental democratic self-determination is essential as a prerequisite of uh, legitimate authority. Uh, and we also have a legal argument. So now if you look at the international law, there are so many things written about democracy and uh, about sort of the right to political participation, etc. Uh, and the fundamental element, even at the beginning of human rights age, the original Article 21, before the right to political expression, said that the will of the people shall be the, shall, shall be the basis of the authority of government. Uh, now, Universal Declaration is not a legally binding document, but the intention of the states after World War II was to emphasize this classical political theory that the will of the people is the basis of authority. Um, then, in actually legal binding uh, and legally binding conventions like ICCPR, they changed the wording a little bit. Uh, now it's the right to political participation. So the will of the people is not the basis of authority, but everybody has the right to go and elect whoever they want to elect. And the rest is a lot of UN law. Uh, there is um, a General Assembly resolution. Uh, which said that any form of self-government, uh, self-governance can be attained only if the opinion of population is expressed through democratic uh, process. So in order for to create a, a self-governing state, the fundamental element is democracy. People should decide to create the state. Um, then we had a lot of security uh, council resolutions on Namibia and Haiti. Haiti was the first case of pro-democratic intervention when the international community actually went to a state to enforce democracy. Even though they said it's an uh, exceptional circumstances, and you know, of course, uh, like no one will go to North Korea, for example, to enforce democracy because they have nuclear weapons. Uh, while in case of Haiti, they had nothing, so you know, it's pretty easy to enforce democracy there. Uh, Namibia is a very interesting case because they also uh, they uh, outlined the kind of like international democratic standard in those resolutions, but then it got kind of ignored and just got stuck in a lot of other UN documents. Uh, there's a very famous uh, resolution by a Human Rights uh, Council uh, promoting the right to democracy. And this was the first international document where, the document where they actually said that there is such thing as the right to democracy. And then again, it's got very contested by states. Um, lastly, even self-determination. We'll not go into this, but there is such thing as right to self-determination. It's very big. No one really knows what it does. But uh, several commissions, and especially Commission on Human Rights uh, on Discrimination, said that there is such thing as internal self-determination. So the government is conducted through a democratic process internally. So how people express their will for democratic process within the state. Um, so generally, I outlined in that that the legal argument is not really as important as theoretical and factual justification of authority, because uh, I don't really believe that the law can justify the law per se. It's like, yeah, it just doesn't really make sense that you justify something by referring to something. You know, it's like this endless vicious circle. So to justify the law, like the legal argument, is not really essential. Well, again, if we go back and look at the theoretical argument, we can see a very strong, compelling sentiment internationally and domestically to follow those liberal theories, both in terms of political science and contemporary international law, and to consider individuals as a subject, as a source of authority behind international law. Now, uh, to just provide a simple, like, kind of like a simple summary of how it should work. So the will of the people is the source of authority. The people within the state are the fundamental element. They create the government, uh, named the legislator, so they elect it through democratic procedures. And then the legislator creates domestic law, which, is, uh, which has legitimate authority since it was created by the people through the proxy of the government. Now, on international scale, things are a little bit more complicated because, once again, we have the state. And if we look at this, what is the source of state authority? Again, it's people. Uh, the delight to create the government. The government represents a state. And then the state creates international law. So this is the source of authority within the state. It's still people. And therefore, as Bookman explains, uh, the source of authority of a state will be the source of the authority of the created law. So international, the authority of international law should also rest on a will of the people. Yeah, is everything clear? Any questions at this point? Yes. 
comparisons to the Let's do one. Uh, very good class. Um, um, so, yeah, we have this. Uh, the question is now, how, what type of proxy do we have? How people can express their opinions? And, we, and then we have two options. We have authoritarian governance and we have democratic governance. And uh, in my research, I will focus on democratic governance. And there are a few reasons why. Um, generally, I think one of the fundamentals is that in democracy, we have a broad consent of the government in comparison to limited consent of the government in authoritarian regimes. Um, I really support Hume and Green and Harris and their arguments. Their argument was that irrespective of what type of state we're talking about, the most oppressive state is still has the consent of the government. Uh, because as we look, for example, again, uh, there are many of authoritarian regimes that are still working. And why they're, why they're working? Because people still they gave their limited, very limited and narrow consent to the government. There's a lot of external factors like coercion or propaganda, etc. But there's still, it's irrespective of any regime we talk about, there's still consent of the government up until the points where they have revolution. And uh, David Hume put it really nicely when he criticized the uh, law theories. He said that something like, uh, the, all these liberal theories in a way are myth because any state enjoy consent of the government unless there is a revolution there. And if you look factually, most of the states were authoritarian. Uh, back at his time. Uh, nevertheless, there's this very uh, big and fundamental difference. In democracy, we have a broad consent of the government. People actually enjoy governments. They can form governments. They can change governments. While in authoritarian regimes, we have very limited consent. And also consent that's created by often the coercion. And even if we look, for example, at commercial law, if you make a contract and you're coerced to make a contract, your consent is invalid. And I tend to apply the same logic to this distinction that the broad consent of the guards is matter. Actually, like the one that matters. And uh, there are several other reasons to pick democracy over authoritarian regimes. There are, democracy generally tend to promote majority rule, while authoritarian regimes promote minority rule. So the power of elites of like 1% of the inner circle, etc. cetera. Um, democracy promotes fair competition and free press which actually help to express the will of the people. Because if you don't have education, if you don't have press, uh, you, you can't actually form the will of the people as something like, you know, developed, external, and subjective. Um, yeah, formation of the popular will through rational dialogue, and distortion of the popular will through, pop through propaganda. Um, also, consent is a tool of compliance in democracy versus coercion as a tool of compliance in authoritarian regimes. Um, and uh, the differences in flexibility, of course, democracies tend to be more flexible. So generally, this is why now we're focusing on democracy because of authoritarian regimes that are not really supported with the consent of the government to any significant extent. This is why democracy matters. Now, of course, this thing works in like, I don't know, 20 countries in the world, like the left side fully, and most likely in Nordic countries. If we really look at the democracy that works, there are, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> where does China fit in? Mainland China, where does China fit? Uh, it's most likely the feet on the right. Yeah. Uh, so, again, if we look, we'll look at the democracy rankings in a bit. And uh, there are literally very, very <coughs> few countries that would go on the left. Uh, there are a lot of regimes that are, that are semi democratic, close to democracy, but really on the left is perfection. It's, like, it's really hard to achieve. It requires a lot of development and a lot of resources. Um, so, and now we're going to the fundamental question. We're going to assess the facts. If we're talking about the will of the people as a source of authority, what actually matters is whether or not there is the will of the people in international law. And how do we do this? Uh, we, we need to look at the things domestically. Uh, and to assess the facts, whether the will of the people is a source of authority, uh, we need to go through democratization on the, on the globe to look at, you know, at factual states whether or not the states uh, are actually supported with the will of the people. Uh, and let's start with this very um, with this very brief data set. So actually, most of the states on the planet Earth are democratic. They have, to an extent, system of elections. Um, there is a proportion of representation in 84 countries, majority in uh, 85. And there are around 15% with 
uh, kind of like mixed hybrid systems, but most likely those uh, there are not really stable systems. Uh, but generally, 80% of the world is actually governed through some sort of elections. Um, proportional representation tends to be much, uh, in a way, considered to be more democratic as majoritarian system, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, it's it's a uh, it's not really as essential for this time. Um, if we look at the voters' turnout worldwide, so how many people on the planet Earth, around our global population, went to vote in their last elections? Numbers are actually pretty good. Um, worldwide, 65% of the population of planet Earth went voting on the last elections in their country, on the parliamentary elections. On the presidential elections, it was 67%. So more, the, so generally more than 60% the planet Earth actually participated in last elections, which is not that bad. Uh, but I'll show you the video in a second, which is explains why it's not necessarily representative. Uh, and here you can also see, um, you can see different regions and how much where people vote. Unfortunately, in Europe, it's only 60%, which is very unfortunate since I'm from Europe, but it's sad. Um, America is doing really good, actually, especially Latin America. They have a lot of very interesting emerging democracies there. Uh, people in Caribbean are mainly just chilling or whatever. They don't care. Uh, and people in Asia, 72%. That's really impressive. Uh, but what matters is actually, I'll try to open this video. I hope it will work. But we can't really assess democracy based on those numbers because of the reasons that will be explained in this video. So those are like typical elections in quite few countries. You're supposed to be saying. I think so, but that's not. Uh, uh, yeah, it's from a movie called Dictator. Maybe I could time. It's, uh, it's a lovely movie. It's really funny and interesting, uh, politically speaking. Um, yeah, where we're at. And also, the last part of just empirical data is gender representation. So in Parliament, there are around 22.8% of women, so there is still politics is something that's pretty much dominated by men still. Uh, unless, again, you're Nordic countries. I think the morality of my presentation is that we should all just go to Nordic countries. Um, what is more important is to assess democracy on merits. Because as I said before, just if we have something like, you know, uh, just electoral democracy, which is not supported by other fundamental elements, it's not really as important. And uh, to do this, we can look at the democracy rankings. There are uh, two rankings we'll consider today that assess democracy worldwide. Um, the first one is by Freedom House. And they noticed that democracy was in decline for the last 10 years. So we have less and less democratic countries. Every year, many countries are just declining in their level of civil liberties and the efficiency of their elections. In the, in the pluralism within the election system. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one of the biggest that I can think of, it's probably the war on terror and the consequence of 9-11, the disturbances in the Middle East. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things going on in Asia, I guess, as well. I haven't really looked into that. But uh, economic crisis of 2008, and generally, there are a lot of economic difficulties. And all this makes democracy, you know, it started to crack a little bit. Uh, and um, we made a list. Uh, of course, there's a lot of data within it, but I'll just try to simplify it as much as possible. Uh, they um, made a percentage on the world population. So they took all countries. They assessed the level of democracy in the countries. They took the population of each country. And now uh, they made an assessment of the percentage of the world's population that live in either free states, partially free states, and not free states. Well, free states generally correspond to democratic states uh, that take into account the will of the people and try to obtain the consent of the governed. Uh, partially free states that are kind of in between. Uh, there's a lot of countries in Eastern Bloc, for example, Poland and Czech Republic, for example, uh, that are generally, they're partially democratic, but it's still, it's not really fully developed democracies. And not three are 36%. Uh, and here you can look at the map of democracy. This is how it looks like. So uh, you see this, you see like the part goes to Russia where everything's sad. Uh, they're not really free. So the consent of the government is not really fully obtained. Uh, 
Uh, they don't truly, they're not really developed democracies unless you live in Mongolia. This is like the, the bastion of light, we call it. Um, uh, here we have India and Asia generally tend to be pretty doing so-so. Uh, Africa as well, well, we can see the Western world, Latin America, as I said, it's a very interesting example. They're developing democracy really fast. Uh, up here, there are literally like seven people live there, so it doesn't really count. Ice and verse. So yeah, just memorize this data. As you can see now, there is a four, around 40% live in democratic regime, around 40% live in authoritarian regimes. Uh, and we'll get to the conclusion in a little bit. Um, we also have the Economist Intelligence Unit. I found their democracy assessment is uh, it's a little bit more compelling. It's a little bit more developed in a way. So they assess the electoral process and pluralism. They assess the functioning of the government. They assess political participation, political culture, and civil liberties. Um, they do this through the assessment of the balance between executive and legislative branches. So it's very important. Uh, if the executive branch has too much power over the legislator, it's not really democratic. Um, they do public opinion surveys, participation, voters turnout, so it's a lot of research uh, on, their, uh, on their behalf. Um, so to their assessments, one half of the world, uh, half of the world live in democracy of some sort, but the key element is that only 8.9% live in full democracies, and as I said before, it's pretty much Nordic countries, New Zealand, and Canada. Uh, and the United States actually closed their 20th, I think, on their list. So they're like the last full democracy, and the rest are like around 60 countries that are flawed democracies. So what they mean by flawed democracies, they do have, they do represent to an extent, to a larger or smaller, the will of the people, but nevertheless, it's not, it's not democracy, and it's kind of like a purist form. And around 2.6 billion people, more than one third of the world's population, still live under authoritarian rule. And what they mean by that, it's pretty much just, yeah, authoritarian rule with very centralized government. And it's one third of the world. And with a large share being uh, in China. Um, uh, and they also notice that generally in the, in the course of the last years, there's a decline of participation in politics, of people's interest in politics. So people tend to be, uh, not to say lazy, just uh, as they said, they feel disappointed in democracy, especially in many places in the Western world. And like, uh, even if you look at the elections in the US, for example, of Donald Trump, if you look at Brexit, uh, there is a significant amount of people who just generally started to be more skeptical about it. Um, yeah, and here is the, again, the percentage of the world's population. So we have 34% living in authoritarian rule. We have 17% in hybrid regimes. Uh, in their terms, hybrid regimes are not really good regimes. So it's not even like Poland, it's something that kind of like is still building, not building really well. Flawed democracy is around 40%. So there's a very significant amount of people lived, in democrat lived under semi-democratic rule. It's, it's a fair, it's, it's a very long list. It starts with a pretty fair democracies and the end of the list where the scores go lower, it's uh, starting to get very mixed. And full democracy is only 9% of the population. So there are a few examples as well. We have full democracies like Norway, Sweden, Iceland, New Zealand, beautiful countries. Uh, flawed democracies, Japan, Costa Rica, Belgium, France, Mexico, Hong Kong, and Ghana. So Belgium and France were interesting. Uh, the problem there is that since the war on terror and the terrorist attack, and there are a lot of things that happened within there and the economic crisis. So there are a lot of problems in democracy within those countries, even though they're Western and they're pretty high in rankings, but they're not really full democracies after those events. Uh, we have Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is very interesting because they had very high level of political participation and political culture, but due to the inherent flaws of the system, due to the basic law, the level of actually, uh, uh, the level, like again, the balance between executive and legislature and other elements, they're pretty low. So they had literally like, uh, it's from one to 10 scale, and they had some elements like five and some elements around 10. Uh, we have hybrid regimes, so you can see those are like, Chile country, Bolivia, Bangladesh, Uganda, Ukraine, Morocco, and Cambodia. And we have authoritarian regimes, which are Algeria, Haiti, China, Qatar, Rwanda, Syria, Cote d'Ivoire, and Russia. But Russia is, of course, Western propaganda. Russia is very democratic. So yeah, uh, if we look at the facts, again, going to the fundamental question, whether or not people are the source of the state's authority to form international 
to the fundamental, uh, to the fundamental, to the kind of like coming to a conclusion. If we look at this, 40% of the people live in democracy. Uh, 35, 40 are governed by authoritarian regimes, and 20 in transition. So we have two very competing forces, authoritarian rule, that are still pretty strong in the world, and we have fully developed democracies that are fair amount, but they're not even making a half of it. And 20% in transition. So if we look at this in terms of the consent of the governed, in half of the cases, they're not really strong link between state and the people. And therefore, if you go again to the authority of international law, and the authority of states to form international law, in many cases, unfortunately, it's not the will of the people. Uh, economically, just for your interest, I think economics gets to do a lot of this. It's really interesting that democracies have around 75% of the world's GDP, while after turning have only 25, uh, with China holding around 10. So they're, I think, second or something like this in the list of GDP. So you can also see that democracies tend to be more wealthy, more developed economically in this sense. Um, now, what is happening there in terms of international law, as we said, there is really often a lack of consent of the people to uh, a lack of consent of the government. So we can actually see a split, a political split. Undemocratic states stand for preservation of their sovereignty and challenge the Western position on the interpretation of international law. Like, for example, in Russia, China Declaration on the Promotion of International Law. <coughs> so since states have different authority, many states don't have consent of the government as a source of their authority. Uh, there's a very complicated ideological clash, in a way, and we can see this through those preservation of state sovereignty, and we can see this through the challenges of Western position on how we look at international law. Um, and what I'm trying to say with this is that if we look at things uh, objectively and try to assess the fact that a significant amount of states do not base their power of their authority on the consent of the government, a lot of states. And Hence, we can't fully base the authority of international law and authority of states to create international law on the consent of the government. Because it doesn't matter how much we justify it theoretically, de facto, it just isn't really the case. And hence, um, what we need to do, I believe, is to look at the alternative sources of authority of international law. So the people at this stage of history can be the main source of authority to states to form international law. Uh, we can look at different justifications for a uh, state to create international law. Um, and here are the few issues that I highlighted. So this is like two thirds of the presentation. I'll try to go through the last bit in like 15 minutes, and then we can go to the questions. Um, so yeah, since the consent of the government is not a solitary source of the state's authority, what are the alternatives? What are other sources of state authority we can look at? Um, since international law is based, is very neutral, so it's very state dependent, can state base their authority on various sources and can this, can those different bases of authority coexist? So whether or not we have democratic states that are based on consent of the government and authoritarian states, can those different types of authority actually coexist and cooperate? Um, so whether we can have essentially the mixed authority of international law, not purely democratic, but kind of in between, something that is factually there. Um, and to look at this, we, can, uh, we first need to start to look at alternatives. So consent of the governed is the very main, kind of like mainstream justification of authority. There are several others. Uh, there's a legal authority, which is like legal positivism and uh, et cetera. So it's a law dependent authority. So law justify the existence of law. Constitution justify the existence of constitution. We have Kelsen, Hart, and Rust to support it. Um, we have moral authority. So this is a very content-dependent authority. Those are the natural laws, human rights, that you know that, that are there just because we're humans. You know, they exist there eternally, and so on and so forth. Um, those are by Rawls, Blue Cannon, and Waldron, and several other scholars. Uh, Beneficial consequences of authority, those are outcome-dependent authority. So as far as the state makes the life of people better, then it's a legitimate state. So as far as the life of political communities progresses, the welfare increases, then um, 
yeah, then it's pretty much a legitimate state. And I heard this argument actually in relation to China, um, that as far as China brings like still higher up the level of living for the general population, it's it's possessed legitimate authority based on again on the on this outcome dependence. Um, so this is a very pragmatic approach, and I think very interesting if we look at the things a little bit more objectively. And the last one, as we discussed, public reason and democratic approval. So it's a consent-based authority, and those again, Smith, Lockberg, or so. Um, so, and at this point, yeah, I think at this part, the presentation will start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, so there are four different types of authority, and people try to argue them in so many ways, and there's so much arguments for each one of them, and one, this is one is the best. So what I try to look at is whether we can, not to justify them, but to mix different types of authority within the singular system. So to use different types of authorities uh, in international law. Um, and to look at this, RAS have a very interesting approach to the justifying authority. Uh, and if we develop his approach, it doesn't really depend on this like moral legitimacy, outcome dependence legitimacy. It's very context based. Um, and I'll try to introduce you this his concept as simple as possible. Um, so an institution, which is A, in our case it's a state, possesses the legitimate authority over a subject to be for example, people, F2 conditions are met. Uh, its directives are content independent, so it doesn't matter what A says, it's the law because A said so. And its directives are exclusionary reason for compliance. So uh, B complies just because A issued them. So for, it's kind of like to outrule everything. We follow the law because it's the law. But there are two fundamental conditions to this to such uh, legitimacy. It's a dependence condition and normal justification conditions. So the state can justify its authority in any way as far as its directives, its laws, correspond to objective reasons or circumstances to act in a certain way. Uh, so for example, there are objective reasons to follow a certain procedure. There are objective reasons to not bomb each other with nukes if we talk about international law. There are objective reasons to follow a certain pattern of behavior. And an authority can derive uh, its uh, authority of legitimacy from any source as far as its laws are comply with objective reason applied to the one it governs. Uh, and the second one is normal justification condition, is that the authority should enact laws that are, kind of to explain in simple words, should provide the best possible alternatives to governance, to, to the subject that governs. Uh, so people would benefit if they would follow the law on comparison if they will not follow the law. Um, and since it's a little bit hard, I just try to make it as simple as possible, this beautiful chart. So there are objective reasons to act in a certain way. There are objective <coughs> reasons for me to not jump, for example, from a roof. And a legitimate law, it can derive legitimacy from anywhere it wants as far as its directives uh, match objective reasons to act in a certain way. So there must be correlation of law to the objective reality, to the objective reasoning to act in a certain way. And this was the Ra's uh, conception of legitimacy, which will develop a little bit. So in essence, legitimate law provides alternatives to navigate through objective factors while preserving the autonomy of its subject. So the point of the law is not to limit our autonomy, but to provide as guidance for different objective uh, reasons or circumstances we have. And a legitimate institution, a state, for example, create directives that correspond to objective reasons applied to its subjects that in a certain way. And hence, it doesn't per se depend on democratic legitimacy or on any other legitimacy. As far as it's objectively justified, uh, a state can derive its authority from anywhere it wants. Um, and then there is a coordination-based approach, which is kind of a little bit the developed version of uh, region uh, system that's been developed for international law. So if law is in a way is a coordination mechanism. As we live in a, for example, within a state, it's to uh, promote the cooperation within the community, to promote, uh, yeah, to generally just to make our community work. So you know, we don't like kill each other or whatever. Uh, and the same applies to international law. So the law is a coordination mechanism to provide a framework for its subjects to cooperate peacefully. Um, 
and in a sense we can look at international law. Um, sources of authority are defined, can be defined on a case by case basis, whether or not it's public reason. So you know, we do this for public safety, where there are moral reasons to do that, the moral legitimacy, or the outcome depends legitimacy. So we can base authority on many different sources. What, it, what matters is that it's capacity to promote coordination and reflect objective reasons. And hence, as we look at this justification of authority, it's a fragmented and, monolith and non-monolithical basis of authority. So again, considering such complicated differences within between states and international law, it is essential to take into account the differences in governance, and we can't just justify it on the consent of the governor. So what we can look at is actually the coordinative capacity of international law. Um, and again, authority can differ based on social and cultural context and other contexts. If you look at international law, it's so complicated. Um, and this is why, yeah, this uh, assessment of objective ability for law to promote coordination matters. Um, and in the essence, authority is legitimate as far as it meets objective reasons to act in a certain way. And again, for states, they can derive their authority from wherever they want, as far as the law that we create, as far as law that states create, uh, will reflect the reasons to act in a certain way. And the example is, of course, there are many examples in international law, the prohibition on use of force, uh, probably the main one, because wars are not beneficial for individuals, and there are a lot of objective reasons to not do that. Um, mm. So in a way, when we look again at international law, then what we have is the mixed authority of international law. It can be, if it can be purely democratic consent, then it can be those various justifications. Uh, since international law is unlikely to be unified in terms of its authority. Uh, different sources of authority are not necessarily self-excluding. So for example, one can derive its authority from democratic consent. One can derive its, its authority from the beneficial consequences. Uh, and I mean, it's a very subjective judgment to say democracy is better than beneficial uh, outcomes. So you know, if you look at things objectively, it's kind of keeping things neutral. Um, and yeah, I mean, as I said before, I think I kind of repeat myself. The legitimate authority of the state, the, the essential conclusion is that the legitimate authority of a state to form international law is based on its qualitative capacity to create law that reflects objective reasons to act in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, now the last question, whether it will work in practice, because you know I thought so much about will it work or not. Well, there are several major obstacles of why objective law or the subjective reasons to cooperate, to justify the authority, will not necessarily work. And those are, the ident identify an objective reason for cooperation. It's very hard, because we have, again, we have various states, and yeah, they derive the power from different sources. Uh, considering the complexity of many situations, it's just hard to identify the objective reasons to you know, act in a certain way, because there are so many variables. You know, and again, we have the objective reality versus subjective minds. There are also limits of human rationality. Humans are definitely not rational, unfortunately. This goes a little bit into psychology, but we can all talk about rationality while in real life there's a lot of psychological factors that also reflect, because law is a law of, you know, for people, and people have their own limits. Uh, so, yeah, human rationality, you know, those objective grounds, it's, uh, it's <coughs> rather unlikely often. And a lack of coordinative capacity in complex issues, uh, again, law tend to be, their international situations tend to be very complex, and uh, we, we can just face a lack of important capacity of international law states to solve certain issues. So will it work? Most likely no. This, this is the sad face. This is my preliminary conclusion, so maybe we'll make it work, but so far, that's it. Uh, and just to give you a summary, just you know, so you can ask questions or whatever, to a large extent states create international law. It was asked, what is the source of states of authority to form international law? Uh, we follow the structure of states and a lot of theoretical and legal arguments, and we figure out that there is a strong tendency to believe that the consent of the government is the source of authority of states to form international law. Then we assessed a factual situation, and we kind of concluded that de facto it's not really the case. Uh, half of the states are not really democratic. Therefore, the consent of the government is not really a source of state authority to form international law. We look at alternatives. Uh, we look at race or Raz's notion of authority. And we kind of propose to have this mixed authority of international law as far as it reflects objective reasons to act in a certain way. 
very much, Arjun. You covered a lot of ground. Um, so let's uh, begin the Q&A session, this gentleman here. Yeah, um, I mentioned about, well, you're from Russia, and uh, I mentioned about Georgia. Um, I was wondering if you can cite some examples along the lines that you have mentioned uh, from author author Florian to, uh, uh, to the uh, dem uh, democracy. So along the, along the region of Russia, uh, along the uh, rim, of the Russian border. Uh, which country uh, moving in the right direction as far as you're concerned from authoritarian to uh, democracy? Uh, Georgia, one of them. Uh, what are the other ones uh, that are, you know, as far as you're concerned is, 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 is you know, the former Russian, uh, Russian control uh, moving to the, to the uh, west, uh, well, not west, but in the democracy uh, as far as you are concerned, because you are from mm. that area. Uh -huh. um, well, now it's uh, the president of Uzbekistan died recently, I think a few days ago, and it was a very authoritarian state. Uh, what now? Pakistan? Uzbekistan. Oh, you're right. And uh, now, no one really knows what will happen, because it was a very authoritarian state, and now they're kind of this in transition, but I assume they'll still stick to the authoritarian governance. Otherwise, Ukraine, maybe. Uh, it depends what will happen there, whether or not it will stay unified or separated, but I think the Western Ukraine is pretty much, eventually they will move towards the Western democracy, like the Kiev part. Um, Georgia? Georgia, I'm not pretty sure. I, I'm not familiar with their situation. I think it's pretty complicated. There. Because it's pro-Western, actually, as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. Yeah. I just don't know whether they're, you know, moving in the democratic I think so. I, I think generally, of the country decide to be pro-Western. Usually, there are a lot of like Western forces that are ready to support this financially, to provide some capacity building, democracy capacity building, and so. Uh, but I'm not really familiar with the Georgian situation. Uh, like speaking about Ukraine, I, I do think that the Western part of the Ukraine will move towards the EU. Uh, the rest, like Belarus, they've been pretty static. It will really depend on the economic capacity of Russia uh, to maintain the influence in the region. Uh, so it's, it's a very complicated issue. So, but, but certainly the uh, prior, like Poland, Poland actually mm -hmm. is, and also the Baltic states, mm -hmm. uh, previously uh, now in the... Okay, let's take another question. Yeah. So uh, could you elaborate on the concept of flow? Democracy, because you said France, for example, as a mm -hmm. global democracy. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I mean, in Italy, we think that in France, we're a good democracy. But uh -huh. Everything you know, beyond the Alps is a good democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of limitations on. So the pro the thing is, flawed democracy it really depends. It can be flawed in very many in many different ways. I believe that in France, it would be mainly related to the war on terror and. Uh, civil liberties associated with this. So for example, you can't wear burqas, and this is also a limitation of liberty. Uh, you can't really express certain views. Um, generally, uh, I would say France and Belgium, with mainly civil liberties. So the system of election per se, it's still working. Uh, but to what extent people can participate throughout, you know, separate from elections within their like and their general political life is kind of limited. So, you know, there are a lot of limitations for people of Muslim background of, you know, what can they wear, what they can do. And, uh, yeah, this is what makes a democracy flawed. It's, the, it's kind of, it started to be a little bit selective. So, you know, some people have more rights than other people. So it's like twisted. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you look at France, there are a lot of very interesting examples because even people who committed terrorist attack they're actually French, they grew up in France, they just lived in those kind of like separated communities outside of Paris, where it's basically like, in a way, like a ghetto where they don't have access to proper education. They live in those very, yeah, very separate communities without, you know, really in touch with French culture, without in touch with French society. And this is like the separation of society is one of the issues there. But of course, that characterization of law democracy comes from the economist study, is that correct? Mm -hmm. there, are, there are five. It comes from one of those studies. Yeah. It's not the core, it's not the focus of your research, whether no. it's flawed or not. 
But you could so you could read <coughs> whatever it's whether it's the Economist or the others. So you mean Economist magazine? Yeah. Oh. This gentleman. Um, I'm interested in uh, how you see pluralism fitting into your your uh, fitting into your um, thesis because in, on the one hand you 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 seem uh, to be saying that we should really respect different sources of legitimacy, and that sounds very pluralistic to me. On the other hand, you're saying, uh, you're, you're positing the existence of, or you're hoping for the existence of an objective reason for cooperation, which sounds to me to be kind of conflicting with pluralism. So I'm just seeing how you think pluralism fits into uh, your thesis. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, generally I tend to be, because of my political views, they're uh, very, very liberal. Uh, but at the same time, if we look at things objectively, uh, well, the world is just not really as liberal as you know people tend to think it is. There are so many places on the planet Earth where, for saying something, you can get killed. Uh, there are a lot of places where elections is just a myth. So why I'm standing for pluralism is that objectively it's important to understand that the world is not as democratic as we think it is. Purely democratic, there are very few countries. So, in order to address this, we need to first, in a way, accept the reality, accept that the world is pluralistic. The sources of authority are pluralistic. It's not exclusively the consent of the government. I mean, I fully support the consent of the government, but if you look at this objectively, it's just not the case. Um, and I think the best alternative for this, since we can't build democracies everywhere, uh, at least now, and I'm not sure if we'll manage to do this in like in 50 years, in 100 years, especially considering the problems in the world, that the best thing we can do is just to try to find this mutual ground, this mixed legitimacy, and try to look at the objective cooperation instead of, you know, like naming and blaming, like, well, we have consent of the government, you don't have few similar points. Yes. Uh, do you think uh, remove international law can ever be achieved um, with careful institutional design of um, the international law enforces or lawmaking process. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, can you repeat it again? Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, the rule of international law will ever be um, achieved using um, careful institutional design of, of the lawmaking body or the law enforcing organization? Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on uh, how the concept of state sovereignty will evolve. Because if we look at this now, for example, recently there is a case with Hearst in the UK. Uh, well, not sure if it's actually recently, but it's a very long standing. There's an international body, the European Court of Human Rights, that says that the ban on prisoners' right to vote is illegal. Uh, it uh, it's contradicts with uh, certain human rights in the European hemisphere. While the British government says that it's their decision, it's their, it's their democratic. Uh, democratic national decision to ban people who are in prison from voting. And then we have the issue, we have international institutions that are vastly supported. The European, Human, the European Court of Human Rights is a, is a vastly supported institution. And then we have this uh, domestic rejection of its decisions. So I'm sure I'm really answering your question, but in a way uh, it will depend on how states will view sovereignty, if they will still stand on something like it's a domestic matter and for us it's relevant what you say in the UN or in the EU or something like this. Then we have a lot of problems with this. Then we can have build this kind of like unified international law. So I would say it goes to the question of legitimacy of international institutions and to what extent the states will stand in their sovereignty. So again, it's, it's a pretty complicated issue. Uh, well, as, as we look now, it's pretty hard. We have the United Nations, and there are so many uh, difficulties. Even in the Security Council, there are like 12 states who can't agree on anything. So part of that question was about enforcement of international rules. And I think speaking about Hearst is a relevant example where enforcement, and that, that decision remains unenforced, mm -hmm. right? unimplemented. Um, and it's partly because of the will of the people, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, in a way, I, I think so. It's it's like uh, I mean, it's a decision of the government. The UK government is fairly democratic, so uh, to an extent, yeah. There's still people. You know, we see we still people see ourselves as you know defined by our nation. So again, it's it's complicated. There's a good question about contrasting the making, which is the focus of your study, and the enforcement. Enforcement, yeah. So I'm actually maybe another PhD student. 
will of the people and the enforcement. Um, so I have a question. Uh, when we talk about international uh, law, we assume uh, general law that is applicable to whole other uh, human com uh, community across every country. So there is only one international law. But as you have pointed out in your presentation, uh, the source of legitimacy, uh, legitimacy is so plural. And I pretty much agree with your account of like different sources in accord with the pluralistic uh, uh, reality of the different regime having different kind of sources. So my question would be, uh, is it meaningful to continue to speak of there is only one international law, or could we uh, uh, imagine a world where there are several international law? For example, Europe, uh, in European Union, actually, uh, the human right could be considered as a supranational or international law per se. It's not applicable to the whole community, but it's applicable to a region whereby there is a unified concept about the source of legitimacy. For example, Turkey was far from enjoy, uh, joining the EU, partly because well, uh, it was not democratic enough or it was oppressing some kind of human right. Uh, so uh, within Europe, the people there, the country there, unanimously uh, agree with the pr principle of democracy so that the law could be binding on, uh, within themselves. And there are some news saying that Asian country Asian countries want to build its own uh, human rights chapter or something, or uh, inter-region court. So my question would be, under this fact of pluralistic uh, sort of legitimacy, would it be more useful to envisage a world whereby there are several international law that accord with uh, different circumstances, different uh, inter-regional uh, or region, intra-regional uh, values or history, and to apply that? Uh, that would be more useful to a uh, uh, all binding, only single international. So that's my question. Um, yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a very good point. I think I can um, give you an example. For example, if you look at the domestic system, we have the uh, we have municipal law, constitutional law, small municipalities, and we have the system of uh, federal law or the system of state law. So even if we look at the system as relatively small state, there's different layers of legal system. And the same uh, where I'm coming from in Russia, we have the federal law and we have uh, state law. Of course, the power of state law is fairly diminished. Um, and generally, if we look at the reality, yeah, of course, there is a regional international law. There is a lot of, there is a EU law. As you said, in Asia, they have Asian, A-S-E-A-N, or something like this. Uh, and they try to implement to have their own <coughs> charter as well. Uh, so the thing is that I, I'd say when we talk about international law, we're not talking really about regional law, but some fundamental law that governs uh, us all. Especially considering that interactions now are can, like taking account globalization, they're much more widespread. So there are more things to govern internationally. There are of course certain things that we can govern regionally, domestically. And as you said, it's reflected actually the. Um, the Asian Charter of Human Rights, as, as I saw in the draft, it was very highly criticized for being, uh, I think in almost every article they said, like, taking into account the cultural differences with the Western world or something like this, which means that, like, we cannot follow this, you know, it's a cultural difference. Uh, so, yeah, definitely, I'd say to the same extent as in domestic law, we have the state law and municipal law, we can have international law governed everybody and we can have regional international law. And uh, in a sense, uh, yeah, perhaps region law can enjoy more kind of like unified uh, legitimacy, like democratic legitimacy in the EU or different types of legitimacy in Asia. But when you talk to the international law in general that exists and it's a very vast and important layer of law, then it's important to look for alternatives. More questions? Comments? Yes. In this modern world, I mean, the, the value of a law depends on fairness. If the population thinks it's fair, it's more likely to be followed by people. Uh, since I'm from the USA, and I understand the American system, you have what they call three branches of government. And there's supposed to be checks and balances, the president, the judicial, and the representatives. But at the end of the day, who really makes the laws is the companies working through lobbyists in Washington to, to give the representatives to vote what they want, and no matter what the people voted for. Do you have an opinion on 
uh, no, it's a very, uh, it's a very realist approach. This is why I said there are very few real democracies. This is why there are a very limited number of them. Because of course, if you look at things objectively, do you know, yeah, there's a really uh, nice book called Thank You for Smoking. It's about the U.S. system and tobacco lobby and the uh, legislator. Um, yeah, it's certainly true, of course, the, because democracy generally, the consent of the government, it's something very, it's something very rare and often very Oedipus in terms of it's hard to implement. Many people don't care about governance. Many people don't understand governance. For many people, governance is something just make it stable and uh, whatever. Uh, and there is a lot of financial interest, definitely. Uh, in most of the countries, I would say, there is always there is a political elite uh, that just stays in power because they have more money, they go to the better schools, you know, they go higher in politics, and so on and so forth. It's like those, I, I don't know how you say this, like a voice club uh, of, you know, of the politicians. So, yeah, certainly, it's true. And this is one of the flaws of democracy. Uh, this is uh, why I'm also standing that we should understand that democracy can't work everywhere. And even if it works, it's not works perfectly in most of the cases. Okay, I want to make one more quick point. In this world of social media we live in today, we really have the potential to have true democracy, where all the people can vote with their mobile phones on all the issues, but the power elite would never allow it. I mean, yeah, certainly. But uh, there are many issues like this. Like, uh, I, you probably heard of Noam Chomsky. I think he writes a lot about this, and he has a lot of fair points. Because, of course, even if you look at the media, something like manufacturing consent, even the media that you know, we live in, like the New York Times, they're all affected by financial interest, by the amount of readers, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, of course, and the same goes to the secrecy within the uh, governmental institutions. Like, we have secrecy not to preserve our security, but to preserve the security of the system. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, it's just the problems with power. Power just, you know, it's, it's power. It's, it's always... It, it's always got its own flaws. And you don't see this on the news. You don't see this on the news. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I think we can speak loud enough. <laughs> so I think there was this like Italian lawyer that said modern democracy is not about representation, it's about delegating. And the difference is, is you don't want to be represented, you want to just delegate the power so somebody else can do it for you. Does that fit your research, like, that you know there is a will of the people who, that they don't want to care about, like, democratic governance? Um, like, generally, I would say, this is, I think, very important to stress. I, I do believe that there is a difference between governing small societies and big societies. So if you look at Nordic countries, for example, Iceland, it's a very small community, so people have more direct interest in governing. Uh, in many cases, like for example, in Russia, many people just you know they don't, they don't care about voting as far as the system is working. As you said, you know they just to delegate. You know someone else will do it. The central government will do it. Uh, and yeah, it's a very important point. I think it goes generally to the criticism of democracy per se. Uh, Again, uh, as, uh, as I discussed in the slides, there is a certain crisis of democracy in Europe. Like, people just don't really believe in the system. You know, if you ask anyone, what do you think about, like, your president? And so many, I mean, in 90% of the cases, you'd be like, ah, oh, you know, he's not a good person. With the, like, and you generally, no one likes politicians. I mean, who the fuck likes them? That's, that's the problem. And, yeah. But I just somebody voted that. for him, right? Hmm? But somebody voted for him. Uh, it's a uh, usual justification is that oh, they all bad, we just pick the one that's like least bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone have any more comments or questions? Yes. Can I push my previous question a bit more? Um, so, so you said that um, you're, uh, you, you believe in some sort of pluralism, and that's part of the point of this project. Um, um, but one of the big concerns that pluralists, for example, I have, uh, is the, the idea that there is a neutral ground or an objective reason, uh, and, and there's the danger of exploitation as well, but also on a theoretical level. Like, it, like um, there seems to be a conflict between your pluralist ambitions. 
and this idea of an objective reason that people can agree on. Um, I do think I, I do think that there is objective reasoning, and you can match this objective uh, reasoning with pluralism because if you look at things objectively, you know there is uh, what is objective ground? It's something that compromises the interest of different actors to an extent that it makes kind of like all of them benefit to a larger extent. So in terms of uh, how, I, uh, how I ground this is that, for example, uh, I don't know, like China and UK negotiate something. They have different sorts of power. One can send the government to the other one, uh, objective uh, or with it. Outcome, de outcome dependence, you know, the promotion of welfare and etc. And they need to negotiate a matter. So while they're negotiating it, they base their power on different grounds. They have different interests, but they find to kind of like they trying to find this objective compromise that will feed both actors. Uh, so this is what I was trying to say. Uh, I mean, I guess what you refer to is different interests in how they can kind of like operate. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. okay. All right. So if there's no more questions, and I think it's been uh, quite an engaging uh, seminar, and my hat's off to my colleague, Professor Reyes, because I think the series is a very excellent idea, um, not only for the student, uh, who uh, I think you'll see has profited from the interaction and just the opportunity to stand up and to test uh, his ideas and encourage all of you who may be research students to do something like this before the confirmation. Um, but it's also valuable for the supervisor who now has a better idea of what the student is working on. So please, thank you and join me in thanking Artem Sergeant.